Ever since the second Russian invasion in February 2022 into Ukraine, NATO countries have been stepping up their support for the Ukrainian armed forces in supplying weapons and equipment. Initially, much of this help was focused on ground forces and air defense. While the current air situation appears as a stalemate, Ukrainian ground forces do manage to successfully push back the Russian forces at this moment. To maintain the momentum then, the short-term and long-term support to deter the Russian VKS, or the Russian Air Force, is required. Next to additional transfer of surface-to-air defenses and munitions, a transfer of Western-style aircraft and air weaponry would present a new threat to the Russian VKS, especially if the fighting continues into spring and summer of 2023. For this, various aircraft like the Swedish Gripen C or the American F-16 have been proposed, although a decision is yet to be made. Now, I want to talk in this video about how such a transfer could occur, whether that's the Swedish Gripen or an American F-16 in this video and explore this topic a little bit more in detail. For a disclosure here in the interest of transparency, I was recently on a study and filming trip to Saab in Sweden. I went there with my own money. Patreon supporters and channel members fund these sort of research and filming trips and Saab was only involved in facilitating access to some of their equipment and expertise. This video is idea is quite older than the actual study trip, but I thought I'd do it afterwards in order to incorporate some of the things I learned as well. While the Ukrainian government has made it clear that it is interested in any Western assistance, Gripen is amongst those planes that Ukrainian minister Oleksiy Reznikov specifically identified in a public statement. I'm really optimistic that Abrams tanks are possible in the future, and I'm sure that fighter jets like F-16, F-15 or Gripen from Sweden will also be possible. While Ukrainian public demands have decreased over the past months, there is frequent discussion on how to best prepare Ukraine for the long term in this conflict. Gripen has been identified as perhaps the most suitable platform when compared to other Western fixed-wing jets. It is worth noting that of the currently available Western fighter aircraft that could possibly be supplied, the Swedish Saab Gripen CD offers by far the most suitable candidate in terms of operational requirements. Now I will spare you the Gripen sales pitch or a rundown of numbers that don't really tell you anything. If you really need them, you can look them up yourself. I mean, they're literally on Wikipedia. To come to the main point, the Gripen is an aircraft that was built from the start to operate in austere conditions with minimal basing requirements and a small maintenance crew. The manufacturer Saab continuously highlights this, yet of course some healthy skepticism to manufacturer figures should always apply. The official turnaround time of 10 minutes does not really explain what is done as part of a turnaround. Depending on the requirements and the context, the turnaround time with an experienced crew chief supported by a few conscripts is likely somewhat longer. Nevertheless, Gripen is optimized for dispersed operations with minimal basing requirements including a single handheld device used for restocking the plane's armament, hot refueling, although in practice this appears to be a bit more limited than the word suggests, and of course takeoff and landing on short runways such as motorways. This alone speaks in its favor for Ukraine compared to some other fixed wing jets as in Ukraine the combat conditions are very close to the specifications that Gripen was designed for. Another important aspect to consider is the capabilities that Gripen C brings. Sweden has emphasized low-level operations in semi-permissive environments with a strong enemy air and surface-to-air presence. Sweden's focus against Russian systems in this environment optimizes its countermeasures, including Gripen C's electronic warfare package. Likewise, Gripen C is certified with modern short-range IR missiles such as Iris-T, but specifically the 2016 certification for Meteor, a BVR missile featuring ramjet propulsion provides a counter to the current Ukrainian predicament of being at an engagement range disadvantage over Russian aircraft. This focus on survivability and long-range engagements could provide Ukrainian pilots with an edge given the current situation in the air. While Ukraine has shown that it can integrate Western systems like the AGM-88 harm missile through clever but makeshift solutions, the required direct interface and data transfer between these weapons and the onboard avionics is currently not possible due to the incompatibility of Ukrainian and Western tech. Of course, just saying that Ukraine should get an aircraft is not the end of the road. A transition from current to future systems requires specific timeframes to facilitate a shift that does not unduly diminish Ukrainian capabilities throughout the transition, 
something I have pointed out in a previous video. So what would it take for Ukraine to get Gripen or any other comparable Western fixed wing jet like the F-16? While many factors are involved, minor or major, I'm going to go through three categories here. Training of crews, the considerations about NATO equipment that are involved, and of course, the political dimension. Ukraine absorbed new weapon systems like the German Gepard or the Panzer Bitze 2000 far quicker than assumed. Yet it is not a given that this translates directly to aircraft. Ukrainian crews, while skilled, pilot aircraft that do not have the same standardization and systems as Western jets. Added to that is of course the logistic and maintenance chain that must be built up in parallel to pilot conversion, where crews need to learn how to maintain a new system. Thus it's just not the pilot, but anywhere from a handful to a dozen people that need specialized training for this. While there are indications that Ukrainian personnel is receiving training on systems that Ukraine doesn't have yet, conversion training to a new aircraft does take time. Estimates on this vary, as one former RAF commander indicates. Conversion to a frontline combat aircraft for a new pilot would usually take about six months to become limited combat ready. However, a more experienced pilot would take less than a half that time. If operational reasons demand it, then a much shorter course for experienced pilots learning a new type focused only on the relevant tactics and weapons could be done in four to six weeks, much of which could be done on simulators. There is no way to know for certain, yet this overlaps somewhat with other estimates published over the last months and estimates given to me by pilots. Even with fast track, a period of about two months is considered a requirement only for the pilot training. Of course, at this point, I'm talking just about the pilot and, well, a small crew that facilitates turnaround. However, we shouldn't really be so pilot and maintenance crew centric. The actual manpower requirements comes with additional training and organizational needs beyond that. If we were to assume a more or less realistic number of about 10 operators directly implicated at facilitating the operations of a single machine, so that's your first line, and then a further 10 to 20 per machine in the rear as your second line, you can see how the challenge scales upwards. Of course, of these, the first line is going to require the most dedicated training conversion to the new machine, as the second line is, at least in theory, already existing in your overall maintenance and logistic infrastructure. They require less formal adjustment to a new machine. Beyond that comes your third line, so heavy duty maintenance and repairs, but that's another story entirely. This also really requires specialized training, but could in fact not fall directly on Ukraine for the time being, with external contractors completing this task. These challenges must not be dismissed with simple optimism, but they also shouldn't prevent Ukraine from actually starting that process of converting towards these new aircraft types, because it seems like that is going to be inevitable. Ukraine and its Western partners have been able to fast track training on many different systems, but as the war drags on, proper long-term planning and training regimes for Ukrainian pilots and crews must start to substitute the more ad hoc solutions. While time can be gained with the early use of commercial and non-commercial simulators and existing training programs, there is an urgent need to set in stone a coherent conversion plan with very specific deadlines to facilitate the introduction of a new aircraft. And that brings me to my next two points. The weapons transfer of NATO equipment and assistance to Ukraine has thus far featured anything from small arms, armored vehicles, air defense, as well as long-range artillery. Most of these more complex systems came in limited numbers as the operational stocks in NATO countries are low. Any transfer of larger equipment starts with the question of how many are available and specifically how many can be transferred without the owner seeing excessive deterioration in their own capabilities. As European countries embark on a course to restock their arsenals, transferring in-service equipment puts a dent in such plans. This also factors into Grip and C. We find ourselves in a totally different situation. The war in Ukraine, entering into NATO and growing the air force and the armed forces and we need to have more fighters than we were planning for in the beginning. Currently Gripen C is flown in Europe by Sweden, Hungary and the Czech Republic. Sweden itself will focus on the acquisition of Gripen E but the C variant is slotted to remain in the inventory into the 2030s with various upgrades. The plans to improve the strength of the Swedish air force thus might counter the availability of Gripen C's for such a transfer. The likely transition of the Czech Republic to F-35 can also free up Gripens in the future, but not anytime soon. 
Related to the question of how many aircraft can we transfer comes the question of whether they should and if with what onboard avionics and weapon systems. I don't refer to the military capabilities per se, but rather the security risk that Western tech might, by one avenue or another, be acquired by the Russian armed forces. Air systems and tech contain highly sensitive information from data links, communication, radar, weapon systems and avionics. Given the protracted nature of the war, an eventual transition is inevitable. So in the long term, this might not really be a main factor, but all involved countries will have to make very specific decisions on what can and can't be transferred. And as some of the avionic systems are not necessarily Swedish, but also incorporate partners from other countries, it can get quite complicated. With the transfer of aircraft, a corresponding logistics chain is also required. While Gripen C is suited to dispersed basing, this doesn't free it up from sort of the regular maintenance and spare part requirements that any aircraft has. A logistics chain with additional long-term support is therefore required in order to keep any chosen plane, again it could be the Gripen, it could be the F-16, it could be anything really, in service. Here, potentially countries like the United States have an advantage to do their comparative abundance of spare airframes and parts. And that leads me now to my final point, the political dimension. NATO countries are united in their assistance to Ukraine, yet political dynamics also account for differences in opinions and decisions. Notwithstanding Turkey's and Hungary's pending decision, Sweden joining NATO has been a major shift for the country's foreign and security strategy. Like Germany, the country used to restrict weapon exports. These are loosened now, but it remains to be seen whether Sweden would accept a temporary loss of combat mass by transferring grippens, risk a potential loss of tech to Russia, and also run the risk of various Russian counteractions, whether they are likely or not. A transition to a new fixed-wing jet can develop into a permanent placement of the system in the Ukrainian armed forces. This means that even a sponsor transfer holds industrial opportunities. This is a factor for Sweden, as Saab has not been lucky with their recent Gripen EBITs. If and how far the country will push is for the Swedish government to decide in the end. From all countries out there, the United States remains in the best position to deliver jets such as the F-16 due to their available numbers and the US's influence, both in supporting their own products abroad and restricting other countries from doing the same as their systems might include American-made components. American aircraft like the F-16 are not optimized to Ukraine's combat environment as is a Gripen, but are more likely to feature in a transfer due to political and industrial factors. The air war over Ukraine has not yet been decided. The situation in the air currently appears to be a stalemate that is good enough for Ukraine to allow their ground forces to push back Russian forces, but in both the short and in the long term, Protection against Russian air assets is required to maintain the momentum. Next to additional and indeed continuous transfers of NATO's uh, surface-to-air defenses and munitions, anywhere from you can you can go from anywhere from a man pads to a highly to the highly successful Iris TSL and of course the longer range systems as well, a transfer of Western aircraft and air weaponry would present a new threat to the Russian VKS that deters a new air offensive and even pushes back the operational ranges that the Russian aviation currently has. Whether that is going to be Gripen, F-16 or any other aircraft remains to be seen. Big thank you here to all the channel's uh, supporters over Patreon and here on channel memberships. Also big thank you with all the people who have helped in the making of this video and in the research. You know who you are. And as always, I wish all of you a great day and see you in the sky.